The race has now arrived in one of the most beautiful parts of America. We're in Virginia at the Homestead. It's day seven of the 1,000 miles Tour DuPont, but it's only day two of the race as it passes through the mountains of Virginia. Hi again, everybody. I'm Phil Liggett. Glad to have you along with our ongoing coverage of the race as it goes through now to its finish in Washington, D.C. on Sunday. I hope you enjoyed our live coverage of the race yesterday when it came into Virginia at the Massanutten Resort because that was where we saw the big boys in this race start to flex their muscles for the first time. The stage was won by a pre-race favourite, Atla Volsvall of Norway. He rides on Greg LeMond's team, Z. We also saw the race lead change hands. It went across from Dave Mann of Britain to the New Zealand rider, Stephen Swart. I suppose the consolation for Mann was simply the fact that Cause Light have both riders on their team. Well, today the riders come here to the finishing line at the Homestead. It's a five-star resort. It really is a super place to be. It has just about everything. And when the riders do get here from the 85-mile run down from Harrisonburg, at least they'll have all they require in the way of recreation and relaxation. Well, this morning, my co-commentator, Brian Drebber, is at the start of Harrisonburg. So let's go to him and see who's with him. Brian. The yellow jersey changed hands again yesterday and now rests on the back of the third man to wear it in this year's tour. New Zealand's Stephen Swart of Coors Light takes on the responsibility of leading 102 men into the mountains of Virginia. It was only in the final mile of the climb yesterday up to Massanutten that England's Dave Mann surrendered the shirt to his friend and teammate and he's now getting ready to defend that jersey, not wearing it, but in support of the new race leader. David joins us now and Dave, what happened at the end of yesterday's race for you? Uh, well, we, we, the team always knew that I would be uh, suffering in the climbs, and uh, the race yesterday was very hard. The team uh, worked well to control the race. But Steve, Steve has always been behind me, and I knew that if I would crack on the hill, Steve would be always there to take over the yellow jersey. I lasted until the last kilometre, and then, uh, unfortunately, I lost my chain, and it, and it took me a few seconds to get it back on the ring, and uh, I, I, lost, I ended up losing a minute. But uh, Steve, Steve did his job and he's there in the jersey and I'm, I'm really pleased for him. He's been on the, on the same time as me for the last four days and uh, I, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm made up for the guy. Yeah. And the Cause Light team really are a team. Another man who could well be in yellow by the end of the day is Mike Engelman. He's lying in eighth place at the moment, 68 seconds off the lead. Steve's in a really good situation, you know, he's, he's our best time trialist right now and he's climbing incredibly well. I mean, you, you ride for your strongest guy, and right now that's Steve. And Graham Lamont and Greg Lamont this morning enjoying signing autographs. He's always happy. Well, I'm trying to just maintain this high uh, of a place in overall until the last time trial. I don't know how I fare, how, how I will fare tomorrow in, in uh, wintergreen because uh, it's going to be much more of a, t a stage for uh, the pure climbers. But I'm climbing a little bit better than I thought, so maybe I could hold on t uh, close to the to the top riders. I'm not certain if I can. Uh, I'm, I think I'll probably lose anywhere between 30 seconds and a minute, and maybe more. I, I'm not sure. But Atla is is really there to watch any riders that are uh, going away uh, like Lauritsen or Phil Anderson and and if you can tomorrow uh, take time on uh, Lauritsen and, and uh, the most dangerous riders. Uh, here's the man Greg is delighted is on his team Atla Volsvol. He won yesterday. He's now up to fourth place overall just 46 seconds off the yellow jersey of Stephen Swartz. Alexi Graywall there signing in the 1984 Olympic champion. He's Laurent Fignon. He's ninth overall. One minute 11 seconds down. He's been smiling well these last two days. Who knows? He might be out for a win very soon. He's on the same team of course as this man here Gianni Bunyo who wears the rainbow jersey. The only man with that right this year. He's the world champion. He's seven one minute 48 seconds down but you know so far things have gone well for the American Motorola team but perhaps not well enough for team manager Jim Okovitz if we look back and analyze where we're at right now we could have easily have won four stages by now we came that close you know we've got one first two seconds and a third and they were all within inches so we're uh, we're in the hunt we're in the fight and we're gonna bite off a lot more of the elephant today if we can and the 1992 Tour DuPont is brought to you by DuPont. And by the state of Virginia. And by Anheuser-Busch, who 
proudly brings you Family Talk. Let's stop underage drinking before it starts. And when we come back, well, Brian Drebble will be down at the finish and with me in the commentary box. Don't go far away. And welcome back to stage seven of the Tour Japan. Don't forget tonight on ESPN, Wednesday night baseball, starting at 8.30 Eastern time. This will be the Baltimore Orioles in Arlington against the Texas Rangers. And now we're back with the Tour Dupont, and Brian Dreber is now back alongside me, so be it a little out of breath. From James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, a little over 85 miles through the George Washington National Forest, beautiful scenery, mostly narrow winding roads, and a lot of climbing. At the midpoint of this race, there are a pair of second category climbs that come just five miles apart. Then a final climb up to Warm Springs Mountain and a downhill run to the homestead. Well, there has been a 27 hours of racing so far in this year's race, and there is nothing in it at the top. Greg LeMond just 12 seconds off the lead and having a great Tour DuPont in front of the home crowd. But he's having a little trouble with Stephen Swartz, a New Zealand rider who races on an American team. And I think Stephen himself now feels a little bit American too, because he comes from Boulder now in Colorado. The weather is nice, but a forecast of rain before the riders get to the finish, and it certainly feels a little bit thundery in the air, Brian. Indeed, it's mixed weather, and they've certainly had a mixed bag since this race started. It couldn't have gotten any worse than it was the first couple of days, nor any better than it has been the last. So these riders are enjoying the sunshine here, but as you said, a forecast of a bit of rain, and of course the inevitable early breakaway and early attack. This is a short race. Yesterday, 150 plus miles. Today, less than 100. So these riders will be feeling their Cheerios here this morning. Well, we saw Johan Lammertz dash through our picture there. I'm not sure whether he's grimacing or smiling, but I guess Greg LeMond has sent him up the road to try and keep this race all together before we get down to the mountain. There are three climbs today. They are second category climbs. That means they are very steep indeed. Each one taking the riders well over 2,000 feet. It's a tough day in the saddle, and even worse to come tomorrow, of course, when we go up to Wintergreen Resort. On the early roll out of town, the riders trying to keep themselves out of trouble, but there's trouble, sure enough, on the first corner. Riders holding their hands up, and indeed, down on the pavement there, Guido Winterberg of Helvetia, one of the Soviet riders, that's Ratnikov, I believe, and uh, these two will have wheel changes to make very early in the race, indeed, but they will have no trouble getting back on. Well, there is Guido Winterberg, who put up that marvelous time trial before we left Wilmington, which shot him right up the overall classification. A bad tumble, though, for the young Soviet. He's badly ripped his jersey there, and it looks as though his arm is bleeding. Here's Stephen Swartz. He's avoided the trouble, um, which is a constant danger in stage racing, Brian. You've got to watch out for those footy wheels and the clatter of metal. The Tour's Light team has gone once again to the front. They have been on duty, riding defense for the last five days. First for Dave Mann, and now for Stephen Swartz. Roy Nickman has been a real workhorse for this Tours Light team, and once again, he is the tractor pulling that 102 rider train. Well, this is a breakaway. an easy day today on a short ride they're willing to let young scott mckinley 23 years old from sacramento california riding for the spago racing team he's no danger they'll let him ride away and have his day in the sun 
and there's plenty of people around to support the riders on this thousand mile marathon today. Some not showing quite the interest of others. The lone figure of Scott McKinley and he's heading out over the hills now. This is a most beautiful course, you have to believe me when I say that. And Brian, if it wasn't a bike race, I'd like to be riding it myself. Indeed, Phil, the course is fantastic. Along the route, the Coors Light team crossing one of the many bridges as this race route winds back and forth across rivers, undulates up and down because of that. And while it appears to be flat much of the time, in fact, it is a constantly rolling terrain very many small hills. Looks as though Stephen Schwartz here saying a few words to uh, Michelle Zanoli of the Motorola team. It's strange in cycling, you know, but as they ride along, planning their strategy, they're all friends. It's only coming towards the end when they fall out with one another as they race for the daily prize. But let's just recap now. The man out on his own is Scott McKinley going clear five miles after the start and facing a breakaway now of 80 miles to the finish. It's a long, long way to go. If anybody can do it, Scott McKinley can. We'll take a short break and come back soon. Beginning Memorial Day, the 1992 French Open live here on ESPN. Monica Sellis will attempt to win her third consecutive French Open title. That's live coverage beginning Memorial Day, May 25, at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Now we're back, Brian, with the Tour du Pont, and the beautiful route continues. The Peloton still remarkably unconcerned about the breakaway of Scott McKinley. Less than a third of the way into the race, he had already built a six-and-a-half-minute lead. Again, he's not a danger for the overall prize, but a stage win is a big prize indeed for any rider to take. Now, there are 101 others that might be jealous of Scott McKinley's effort to collect himself a stage victory. Well, Scott McKinley, a couple of years ago, really shocked the European riders when he took a fine second place in the French classic stage race, the Dauphiné Libre. And many of the top riders take part in that event to test the legs for the upcoming Tour de France. That was a great performance by Scott. If he pulls this one off today, Brian, this I would rank as his best performance. Indeed, he's coming off a season last year in 1991 where he missed virtually the entire season because of an injury. Late in the 1990 season, he crashed in a criterium race in his hometown of Sacramento into a telephone pole, broke some ribs, ruptured spleen, punctured lung, and no one thought he'd ever race a bicycle again. Indeed, he came back and raced in the Caribbean in the very late part of the season in some exhibition races in November, and he returned to form after a year of not having such good form. Well, the bunch just keeping tempo on the climbs today. They're up and down to 2,500 feet. Then they go down to the basement again. Then they go back up again. But they're just keeping the tempo and they're allowing this man his head. His time is going up and up. And he's heading up now into double figures. The Shenandoah Mountain Descent. So as Scott McKinley goes on, we can tell you the America's Cup, don't forget, tomorrow's race four of the America's Cup will be live from San Diego. Coverage will follow the Tour du Pont at 3 Eastern here on ESPN. As we now watch the whole field in the Tour du Pont thread down the Shenandoah Mountain and still nobody is catching up. In fact, the time gap we're getting, 6 minutes 34 seconds. So while they chase down Scott McKinley, we'll come back. And we're over halfway now on today's stage of the Dour du Pont. It's stage 7, 85 miles. And this is Alexi Greywall at the back of the race. And it looks as though, Brian, we're expecting rain. And Alexi Greywall is asking for a raincoat out of the broom wagon. This is the ceremonial end of the race, sweeping up what's left up ahead of it on the road. It's a fellow named Barney Brewer that drives that broom wagon, and he is always at the service of the riders, no matter whose team they're on. Mike Neal at the service of his man, Scott McKinley, a 23-year-old from Sacramento, California, making good on his breakaway as the weather conditions change. His lead had dropped down to just over five minutes through the feed zone, and he is now on the ascent to the second of the, two, of the three climbs in this race. Well, this is the climb of Warm Springs and Scott McKinley. As you can see, the weather has changed now. Eight miles to the finish. The peloton is smaller. 
but the rain is very, very heavy. Now this might go in favour of Scott McKinley because the peloton are going to feel a little bit uncomfortable. They're not going to take risks on the descent because to slip off the bike at this stage of the race could cost you the Tour DuPont when it ends on Sunday. But Scott McKinley is showing signs, Brian, of feeling very tired, to me anyway. His biggest lead had gone up to 10 minutes plus and down to seven minutes at mile 72. But here on the final climb, he is down to two minutes ahead of the pack and desperately trying to descend into the homestead ahead of the charging field, but they'll have much, much more momentum than a single rider, even on a wet road. A single rider can corner better, but the, pe the peloton has much more momentum. Well, I don't know whether you could hear that, but that was thunder right overhead of the riders into the last four miles of the race. The front half of the peloton, Dirk De Wolf just tagging on the back of the line of the leaders there. The yellow jersey, I noted, was in that front group as well. And so too was Greg LeMond. So the top two contenders in the Tour DuPont are going man for man. And they're going now to try and pick up Scott McKinley, who visibly is getting tired. Scott McKinley riding on the left side of the road, moving over to the right, trying to cut the apexes of the corners and stay away from the charging field, using every inch of the road that he can shorten up on his way to the finish line. But he's done. He stands up. He's really getting tired. His legs have to feel like they're probably three feet in diameter right now, but he suffers on with his eyes focused keenly on a stage win that is ever so close to him right now. Well, Scott McKinley, 78 miles in the lead, and if he cares to take a look over his shoulder now, he'll find the race is all around him. Gilles de Lyon from the Helvetia team, 15th overall, is now looking for the victory. Scott McKinley, he can see literally yards up the road. Hugging the inside, and now he'll move over to the right, trying to get shelter from the trees, shelter from that stone wall, and staying out of the wind, just focusing every ounce of his energy on the last couple of miles of this race. Well, Scott McKinley, it's only a matter of seconds now before he is caught. The pack are just behind him, but my goodness me, what a marvellous attack this has been. But now the men have their quarry in view. Two miles to the finish, and 30 seconds is the official time gap. There's the yellow jersey. Swart is here. So too, one or two other famous uh, faces. Bobby Julek I see here as well. They're swarming towards the finish. Scott McKinley with over 80 career victories during his performance as a racing cyclist would like to make it 81 with this race but it's not looking well coming up we will take the race down to the finish at the homestead Welcome back to the Tour DuPont, the closing miles now into the finish at the Homestead. It's a very difficult finish, it's, uh, finish. it's downhill, and believe me, it's not for the nervous. Now, can they pick up Scott McKinley? Because they must be right behind him, Brian. He's looking over his shoulder, the commissaire vehicles are starting to come by. That signals us that, yes indeed, the race is right behind him because the motorcycles and cars are starting to pass. Scott McKinley has given up his long, desperate breakaway. What a brave effort he has made. Well, you have to feel sorry. One mile from the finish, he would have been in the lead for 80 miles. Instead, now, he's condemned to hang on to the back of this group of riders, including all of the leaders of the Tour du Pont. Yanni Bunyo, the world champion, tried to move there. So, too, Lance Armstrong having a go. We would expect these sort of attacks right now. The frenzy has begun in the fight for the finish line, and a lot of the riders who are just seconds behind another rider they need just those bonuses they give 10 seconds bonus for the winner of the race six for second four for third and often just those handfuls of seconds mean a big difference to riders they can move up a place or two or three if they're able to get into the top three spots at the finish line of the bike race notably greg lamont he trails first place by only 12 seconds if he could win the stage for instance he could move up to within two seconds of race leader steven swart this is McKinley, and he must, I would imagine, be just hanging off the back of the field. Indeed, he is, but he's doing well just to hang off the back of the field now because this is the run down to the finish. It is one of the most difficult finishes in this year's Tour DuPont, and you look at the speed, they're coming off this bend now, and that's Greg LeMond to the far right, just obscured by the motorbike. They're through on the inside. LeMond's got the lead here. LeMond is going for gold in this one. He's got the lead towards the 
finish and Phil Anderson's on the right Anderson has gone by him on the right and that's Bobby Julik he's got by him as well so that's the one two three is Anderson delighted and let's have a look at that Phil Anderson wins the stage from Bobby Julik from the Skittles USA Greg Lamond is second and Rolf Aldog is third but Anderson is the man today when the floodgates open, they open in a big way. You guys just keep pouring on stage wins now. Yeah, well, you know, we uh, won the stage last year with Steve. And so, uh, you know, it's uh, we got to keep out the tradition there. But I think having ridden this last year was a big advantage, you know, because, uh, you know, I knew the finish. And, uh, you know, put on a, a good gear for the, the uh, sprint today. Bigger than last year. So, um, you know, it paid off. <laughs> Well, I, it was just all positioning, you know. I knew that, knew that sprint from last year, and uh, with a K to go, I was like, I could. I started leading it out, and then I was like, oh man, I think I'm gonna, I'm not gonna make it because everybody swarms around that corner. So I let a few guys ahead of me, and then coming in that last corner, everybody was hesitant because the guys who didn't do it last year what, didn't know. But I knew that you didn't have to use your brakes, so I was just in the slipstream of Anderson, and uh, started sprinting as fast as I could. But I had a 53. He has a 55, so. I guess I gotta learn how to put on a bigger gear for these these things that I know the finish. But I'm happy. Oh, I can't say I felt great. I'm not too confident about tomorrow. But we'll see. I'm, what can I say? I don't feel great. I don't, I'm not with the best climbers. I'm not far, but I'm not with them. So it's the wily old Australian Phil Anderson who takes his second stage win in this year's Tour du Pont and he moves steadily up the overall classification. The homestead will be remembered by Phil Anderson, that's for sure. Let's have a look at the route tomorrow. We leave the mountains tomorrow in a big way, stage eight. And look at this, 98 miles. We head up towards the Wintergreen Resort. It is a tremendous climb, without doubt, the most difficult of the race. It was there last year where Atla Volsvold went along and took the stage victory. He did that with a clear victory that gave him the race lead. He went on to lose that race lead and finish second. Will he be out for revenge tomorrow? We know Greg Lamond is watching this program tonight. Well, he won't want to be reminded what happened to him on the climb a year ago. He came in some four minutes behind and the weather was very wet indeed. Let's have a look at the altitude profile. It's not one that the riders want to look at right now because it's hills all of the way and it finishes at the top of the highest one. This is the overall situation. Steve Swart leading by just eight seconds from Le Mans. Phil Anderson in the frame now in seventh place, one minute, four seconds back. Wilhelm leads the sprint competition in the mountains. Tilly Claverola is the king there for sure and cause light in defense of the team championship. The 1992 Tour de France is brought to you by Skittles and by the state of Virginia. And by Bud Light, everything else is just a light. Tomorrow, the Tour du Pont continues with stage eight as we go on to Wintergreen, 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. So as St Sam Sneed gives the yellow jersey to Stephen Swart at the homestead. For Brian Drebber, I'm Phil Liggett. Good night to you.